There we go. Well, good morning, everybody. We are going to get service started now. Um, this is completely new for all of us, of course, so thank you for bearing with us as we get everything set up and have those um, parking jobs made, uh, made done well here where we're separated a little bit, and uh, it's just great to see so many people come out and we can worship together now. And uh, I was saying to Matt and Jason a little earlier that this is technically the first service in over a year where we haven't had any capacity restrictions. Ever since last March, we've had capacity restrictions up until this day. And even though we're not indoors, we're outdoors, we don't have a capacity limit for church service today. So it's wonderful to be able to have the whole church or as many people as we can have out. And as we get started this morning, I have a few announcements just to keep uh, remind you of. If you don't know yet, if you're just listening through the PA system, uh, you could also tune in to 106.3 FM, and that'll give you the radio broadcast so that you can listen that way if you'd rather have your windows up, and it's a, it might be a little warmer that way. Also, if you're trying to listen to both the PA and the FM, you might get a bit of a doubling effect, so just keep that in mind. You might want to choose one or the other. I don't know for sure since I'm not, not where you are right now. Secondly, you can use the washrooms if you really need to. Uh, you can get out of the car to come in and use them if you must. And also, if you need to get out for health and safety reasons, you know, you're not trapped in there. It's not like you have to stay in there no matter what. Uh, so keep that in mind. Uh, I think especially some of you parents, if you need to get out to get to the back to get your kids or something like that, um, or if you're feeling a bit claustrophobic, you can get out if you need to. All right? And then uh, thirdly, we aren't going to be having our midweek Bible studies for the foreseeable future. Um, because of our stay-at-home order, we're going to put those on hold for the time being, except for our Friday night prayer. So Friday night here at the church in person, 7 o'clock, we're still going to have that. All right, and then lastly, next Sunday is Communion Sunday. So we're going to keep doing outdoor services just like this up until the end of the uh, stay-at-home order, until we're allowed to be back inside the building. And so we're still going to try to do Communion next Sunday. So again, I'd remind you to bring out your own elements, bring out the, uh, the juice and the, and the cracker, the bread that you'd like to use, and, um, and then we'll all participate together at the end of the service, okay? Um, just like we've done in the past. Uh, after the sermon, I'll bring mine out, and I'll ask you to get yours ready for as many people maybe as are um, in your vehicle at the time. All right, so that's all the announcements I have this morning, and... We're going to get started in singing some, uh, so, some songs, praising God, and then we're going to have uh, the message afterwards. Let's just prepare our hearts now, going to God in prayer, thanking Him for what He's given us this morning. Father in heaven, Lord, we do thank You and praise You for bringing us here safely. We thank You that You've given us the opportunity to worship You together as Your church family, as the body of Christ. Lord, it is a special thing for us to be able to do and we don't take it for granted. So Lord, help our hearts and minds now to be focused in on what you would have to say to us and help us, Father, to offer up a sacrifice of worship. We pray that you would help the, the music to be uh, meaningful to us, Father. And we pray, Lord, that the message uh, from your word would be, uh, would be speaking to our hearts, Lord, and changing and challenging us to walk closer to you in all that we do. We thank you for who you are. We thank you now in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, good morning, everyone. Can everyone hear me okay? I hope you can hear me okay. Yeah? Is everybody here? Yeah, hey, all right, good. All right. Well, it's great to be with you this morning. I get to say that you get to sing with me today. Hey, everybody gets to be in their own. So everybody should be singing and praising. It feels different. It feels different for me not having the worship team with me. But the same God rules over this world. He is sovereign. He's here with us. And we can put our burdens on him. Now, there's no kid vid today. So we're going to start with a kid song. And the kid song is going to be Cast Your Burdens, Higher, Higher. So if you know what, sing along. I believe you have the words in a PDF. So if you want to join in, please do. Cast your burdens upon Jesus. Super. 
kids were singing along with that, and I hope the parents were as well. I just got to do a quick tune on my guitar because the cold doesn't do well with wood instruments. I don't know if you know that, but anyways, that's some fun facts for you this morning. But another fun fact for you is that we talked about our God being sovereign. And no matter what the elements throw at us, no matter what situations we find ourselves in, God is still faithful. And one day he promises to come back and to call us to the new heaven and the new earth. So the next song we're going to sing in preparation for our message. We've got three more songs to sing together. It's Open the Gates. And I hope for all of you that we would desire to see the Lord come again. I hope that he comes quickly and soon. But let's sing this praise to him and uh, lift up his name. i 
singing with you this morning, church. We'll call on Pastor to bring the word.
Well, good morning once again. It is getting a little windy out here. And uh, I don't envy Matt's job because, yeah, your fingers and your hands get cold when you're playing guitar. That is not fun. Um, but it was great to be able to worship with you. I know he enjoyed it. I pray that you did as well. As we get into God's Word this morning, let's just bow to him in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you again for gathering us here. We thank you for your goodness towards us. And pray now that as we open your Word it would be meaningful to us. We'd have ears to hear what you have to say. And Father, you'd give us your spirit to live out the commands and the direction, the wisdom that you give us in your word. We thank you for it, Lord, and pray that you'd be honored through the worship through your word now. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, if you have your Bibles this morning, I want to encourage you to open them up to 1 Samuel chapter 13. 1 Samuel chapter 13. We've been working our way through the book of 1 Samuel. It has, um, it's been a good yet challenging book. And you might ask yourself, well, what does this Old Testament passage, what does this Old Testament book have to do with us today? It is, um, it's been such a long time since Samuel, the prophet, Saul, the king, David the king, since they walked this earth, what could these thousands of year old stories have to do with us? Well, we've been studying in the book of 1 Samuel about how God is sovereign over all things. First of all, he's in control of everything, and that should bring our hearts comfort. He's a gracious God, a gracious king, meaning that he's going to give to us gifts and he's going to um, welcome us into his presence as his people. Even though we don't deserve it, he's going to do this. But then we've also noticed in the book of 1 Samuel, that we have a responsibility to serve God faithfully. And this is, again, a very important aspect of the book, our faithfulness. For the last few chapters, we've been talking about this idea of covenant, about how the people of God came into special covenant with God himself. God was going to be their faithful, good, loving God. And then the people of Israel were meant to be faithful and loving back to him in a special way, in a way that went above and beyond all other relationships. Uh, so we were introduced to the idea of covenant, but now in chapter 13, with reference to the idea of covenant, we're going to try to answer this question. What is the fatal problem with humanity? Chapter 13 reveals to us the beginning of the end for King Saul. Up until this point, Saul has, of course, been anointed We've seen he has a good pedigree to be king, and we see some really important successes that he's accomplished in his life. But in chapter 13, we see the beginning of the end for Saul because we learn that despite all of his accomplishments and despite um, his resume looking good to be king, he had a fatal problem, and that had to do with his heart. He had a heart issue. His heart didn't really love God the way that it ought to. And so this morning, we're going to study what that looks like for us. What is the fatal problem with humanity and how it relates to King Saul and how we might learn from it ourselves. So if you have your Bibles there in 1 Samuel chapter 13, I'm going to read verses 5 through 14. The Word of God says this, The Philistines mustered to fight with Israel 30,000 chariots and 6,000 horsemen and troops. And they came and encamped at Michmesh to the east of beth -Evan. When the men of Israel saw that they were in trouble, for the people were hard-pressed, the people hid themselves in caves and in holes, and in rocks and in tombs and in cisterns. And some Hebrews crossed the fords of the Jordan to the land of Gad and Gilead. Saul was at Gilgal, and all the people followed him trembling. He waited seven days, the time appointed by Samuel. But Samuel did not come to Gilgal, and the people were scattering from him. So Saul said, bring the burnt offering here to me and the peace offering. And he offered the burnt offering. And as soon as he had finished offering the burnt offering, behold, Samuel came and Saul went out to meet him and greet him. Samuel said, what have you done? And Saul said, when I saw that the people were scattering from me and that you did not come within the days appointed and the Philistines had mustered at Michmash, I said, now the Philistines will come down against me at Gilgal 
and I've not sought the favor of the Lord, though I forced myself and offered the burnt offering. Samuel said to Saul, You have done foolishly. You have not kept the command of the Lord your God, with which he commanded you. For then the Lord would have established your kingdom over Israel forever. But now your kingdom shall not continue. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart, and the Lord has commanded him to be prince over his people, because you have not kept what the Lord commanded you. All right, this is the beginning of the end for Saul. From this point on, Saul is going to have a very contentious relationship, not only with Samuel, but with the people of Israel, and then, of course, most notably, with the new anointed king, who we'll see in a few chapters from now, the new anointed king, King David. And so from this point on, Saul is going to kind of go downhill. And we noted at the beginning of the book of 1 Samuel how 1 Samuel shows us the rise and fall of different individuals. Hannah, at the very beginning, who was a very lowly estate, God has the sovereign power to raise her up, give her a son. The son's name was Samuel, and Samuel would go on to do great things for the people of Israel. She was lowly, and God exalted her. Saul, on the other hand, starts out very high and proud, and there's a lot of good things going for Saul, a lot of successes that he has. In fact, Saul has a lot of really good initial success against the Philistines. A few of the verses we didn't read, a little bit further back in the chapter, in verse 4, um, as Saul goes out to fight against the Philistines, he has great success. It says, Jonathan defeated the garrison of the Philistines that was at Geba, and the Philistines heard it, and Saul blew the trumpet throughout all the land, saying, let the Hebrews hear. And all Israel heard it and said, Saul has defeated the garrison of the Philistines, and also that Israel has become a stench to the Philistines. And the people were called out to join Saul at Gilgal. So Saul has a lot of good initial success as king of Israel. Everyone looked up to him as a man who was mighty, who was strong, who was fit to lead. And he goes out and he has a lot of great success battling against the Philistines. Saul and Jonathan launch successful military campaigns against the Philistines, and Saul ultimately unites the people in their fight, blows the trumpet, everyone comes and gathers. One of the things we should be mindful of then, even though we know where Saul is going through all of this, we know that he's eventually going to crash and burn. We know that he's eventually going to sin against God, and God is going to tear the kingdom from his hands. We need to be mindful Firstly, about God's wonderful grace. Despite all of this about Saul, despite everything we know about Israel, their sin, and Saul and his sin, God is still going to use Saul and Jonathan. Isn't that amazing? Despite everything wrong in Saul's life, God is going to use him and graciously protect and care for his people Israel. The first thing we ought to note from the text then is that God is gracious. A reminder from last sermon. God is always going to be gracious to his people. No matter what, even when we're walking in our darkest times, even if we fall into sin, God is going to be gracious towards us and he is going to welcome us back. We can come to him at any time for mercy and forgiveness. Saul finds a lot of great initial success against the Philistines. Reminds us that God is good. God is gracious, even though the kingdom is going to be torn away from Saul, God is still going to use him to accomplish his will. So God can be glorified in us, through us, no matter who we are, no matter what background we have, no matter what sin or temptation or struggles we have, God can use us and God can be glorified in us. Despite anything that's going on in your life, God graciously welcomes us to love him, to serve him, and to be his people. So while Saul finds initial success against the Philistines, well, the Philistines wouldn't have much of that. And so we learn that the Philistines retaliate against Saul. And Saul faces a really important dilemma. We read about how the, the Philistines muster 30,000 soldiers back in verse 5. They're essentially trying to completely squash the rebellion of Israel. They see Saul and Jonathan, his son, have had great success in their little battles against the Philistines. So now the Philistines are going to say, this is it. We're going to muster as many troops as we can, and we're going to go out and we're going to battle against the Israelites. We'll completely squash their little rebellion. And so they go out and they camp at Michmash, which was kind of Saul's military headquarters. So you can imagine how frightening that might be to Saul. 
At his military headquarters, he sees 30,000 troops marching towards him. Well, the people kind of scatter, and they go and they, they go to a nearby town called Gilgal. And it's here in Gilgal that Saul is going to seek, what he says anyway, is the favor of the Lord. So this is what happens in verses 7 and 8. If you have your Bible there, you can follow along. It says, Some Hebrews crossed the fords of the Jordan, the land of Gad and Gilead, and Saul was still at Gilgal. All the people followed him trembling. He waited seven days, the time appointed by Samuel, but Samuel did not come to Gilgal, and the people were scattering from him. What's going on? Well, Saul and the people of Israel are looking for shelter somewhere, and they believe that if they go to Gilgal, this famous place where they could offer up sacrifices to the Lord, God will hear them, the prophet Samuel will come, and Samuel will give them direction on how they ought to proceed with this military conquest against the Philistines. And it was, it was customary during this day and age for them to wait, as Samuel says earlier on in the book, to wait seven days. Wait seven days for Samuel to come. And when he comes, he's going to offer up sacrifices because, again, Samuel was the priest of the land. So it was his job to do that. And then Samuel would give them a word from God. Samuel would give them the wisdom from God as to what they were going to do next. That's very important to remember. Samuel was the one who was to offer up sacrifices, and Samuel was then the one to give them the word from God. What are we to do next? After seven days, though, Saul says, where's Samuel? He hasn't come at the appointed times. And so when he doesn't arrive in his own timing, Saul offers the sacrifice up himself. It says in verse 9 that as soon as he had offered up the burnt offering, who shows up on the scene? Samuel. Oh, he's caught red-handed. <laughs> Saul's dilemma is simply this. Oh, the Philistines are coming. I can either wait for the Lord and take direction from him through Samuel, or I can strike out on my own. I can try to accomplish the will of God without actually hearing what the will of God is. I can do it myself, in other words. So Saul's dilemma was this. What am I supposed to do? If I wait, the Philistines might come and crush us. If I don't wait, well, I know I'm overstepping my bounds here, but shouldn't I do something? One of the greatest temptations of the human heart that we face, church, is that we think we might be able to succeed without God. When we're faced with our own dilemmas of these kinds, our temptation is to go about our own way rather than trusting God. So the question then for us, what will we choose? We find ourselves in dilemmas like Saul. God, it doesn't seem like there's a good answer. There's a good way out of this. I've been waiting for you, and I haven't heard from you. What does your word have to say? Well, your word doesn't really speak to this issue particularly. What does the wisdom of the church say? Well, the church might seem as confused as I am right now. And we might wonder, well, what's the answer then, God? How are we to move forward? When we're faced with dilemmas like this, what is our response to God? Is it to trust in Him? To wait on Him patiently? Or is it to strike out on our own, as Saul did? The psalmist, Psalm 37, 7 to 8, says this, Be still before the Lord. Wait patiently for him. Fret not yourselves over the one who prospers in his way, over the man who carries out evil devices. Refrain from anger and forsake wrath. Fret not yourself. It tends only to evil. There's a passage of scripture we read a couple of weeks ago at prayer meeting. It's this important reminder for Christians, the encouragement, fret not yourselves. That's exactly what Saul was doing, wasn't it? When he was sitting there waiting in Gilgal, some of his men are abandoning the cause. He knows there's 30,000 battle-hardened warriors coming down to do war with him. The psalmist says, fret not yourself. Easier said than done, right? When you're in a circumstance where you don't know what to do and you find yourself in a dilemma like Saul, do I strike out on my own, do it my own way? Or do I wait for God? Do I listen for Him? Do I open His Word? Do I spend time in prayer seeking out the Lord? Fret not yourself. The psalmist says, wait patiently for the Lord. In our dilemmas, that should be our answer. 
when we're in situations like Saul, go to the Word of God, remind ourselves, preach to ourselves in our own hearts, be still before the Lord, wait patiently for Him. But then lastly, Samuel ends up confronting Saul about his sin. He says in verse 13, Saul, you have done foolishly. You did something you weren't supposed to do. What was the sin exactly in Saul's heart and life that we're to know about? Well, Samuel only says it this way. He says, you didn't obey the command of the Lord. And see, there's not a whole lot of detail that Samuel gives. And the author of 1 Samuel doesn't really give us a lengthy explanation of what sin did Saul actually commit. He just says, you've done foolishly, and you didn't obey the command of the Lord. What are we to understand here? Well, Saul, in doing what he did, of course, he's overstepped his bounds. He did something that only the priest, only the prophet was supposed to do at the time. And we know that Samuel was supposed to do the sacrifices. Samuel was the one who would offer the word of God to the people, so they knew what to go or what to do next. So at very least, Saul is overstepping his bounds. But what we need to see happening here is Saul is denying the very word of God. As Samuel says, you didn't obey the commands of the Lord. You didn't trust the way God said to do things. You trusted yourself and your own way instead. You didn't obey the command of the Lord. It seems a little vague. It seems, of course, like a generic statement about his sin. But at the root of it all, Saul has a heart problem. He doesn't believe the word of God. He doesn't trust the word of God. And Saul offers all of these excuses for doing what he did in verses 11 and 12. He says, oh, well, the soldiers were leaving me. I had to do something. He says, oh, Samuel, you were late. Maybe it's your fault. You didn't come in time. And then lastly, he says, well, the Philistines were coming. What was I supposed to do? I have to act. I have to do something. You don't want me to just sit around doing nothing, right? And for us as Christians, how often do we use excuses just like this? If I didn't do something, God, I was going to lose out on an opportunity. The soldiers were leaving me. Or maybe somebody else is to blame, God, not me. Or God, the enemy was coming. They were telling me to do something. They were pressing in on me. I had to act. You can't blame me for that, can you? I believe the reason Saul and we might come up with all of these excuses for acting rashly without God's approval is because it reflects a deeper problem in our heart. Not just that we committed a sin against God, but that once again, our heart is wrong before God. See, Saul's problem is not simply the act of offering, offering up a sacrifice. We, we must see this. Yes, of course, Saul should not have offered up a sacrifice, but the sin and the problem of it was not just the offering up of a sacrifice, but what lie at the root of that behavior. What lie at the root of his action, what lies at the root of all sinful actions, is a heart that does not trust and believe in God. This was Samuel's diagnosis. He says in verse 14, Now the kingdom is going to be removed from you, Saul. And what does he say? God is now looking for a man after his own heart. Implicitly, Samuel is saying, Saul, you are not that man. You are not a man after God's own heart. Yes, the sin was wrong. What you did was wrong. And we're going to see Saul commit more sin as he goes on in his uh, career as king. The problem wasn't just the activity. The problem wasn't just the act. The problem was his heart. He didn't, have a heart um, he didn't have a heart that was a heart after God's own heart. You might ask, well, what does that mean exactly, to have a heart after God's own heart? Well, to have a heart after God's own heart is to desire the things of God. Or to say it another way, to do God's will. Or to say it yet another way, to obey God's word and God's command. To have a heart after God's own heart is to say, God, your word is true. I trust it. Your word reveals to me your very will. Therefore, your word reveals your very heart, the attitude of your heart, God. And I want to have a heart that's just like yours. 
So I need to know your word. I need to obey your word. I need to trust your will. So to have a heart after God's own heart is to desire the very things of God. It's to do the will of God. It's to obey God's word and his commands. And as king, Saul was meant to rule in accordance with God's word. That was the whole point. Remember going all the way back to 1 Samuel chapter 10, when they made a covenant before God. When Samuel wrote down all the duties and the rules in the book, and he put it in the most holy place. And Saul had made a promise to the people that he was going to uphold his duties as king. And the people made a promise to Saul that they would serve and follow him faithfully. Well, Saul broke that promise in doing this. He broke the promise because he didn't trust in the word of God. So Saul's problem is simply this. He does not have a heart after God's own heart. And this is the fundamental problem with humanity. This is the fatal problem with each and every one of us, that we're born into sin. It's not just that we commit sinful actions, but that the very heart of mankind has a problem. It doesn't seek after God. It doesn't love the things of God, and it doesn't love God's Word. It doesn't naturally desire to obey God's Word. This was the problem of Saul. Chapter 13 is revealing to us that all humanity has this very same problem. Every single one of us can find ourselves in the shoes of Saul, a heart set against God. And unfortunately, a heart that's set against God cannot inherit his kingdom. This is why Samuel says to him, because you don't have a heart after God's own heart, the kingdom is going to be removed from you in verse 14. Unfortunately, we know the same is true for us, any, any person. We will not inherit the kingdom of God if we do not have a heart after God's heart. Well, Matthew chapter 7, verse 21 would say this, Jesus' own words. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven, heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. In Jesus' own words, what is it to have a heart after God's own heart? The one who does the will of my Father, he says. What we need to know, church, is that behind every single act of sin, there is a heart condition. The mere act of sin the mere act of sacrificing an animal out of turn on Saul's part was not the only condemning point of his life. It was the attitude of his heart, of course, that was the real problem. He believed he was above the word of God. And this is the condition that every human is born into. And of course, sin can be manifest in all kinds of behaviors from all the great dramatic ones like murder and theft and abuse to all the tiny little ones like lies and deceits and anger. But what lie behind all of these behaviors in the human heart is much more devious than the external action. What lie behind every single sin is a heart that would say, I want to do it my way rather than trust in God's ways. Rather than wait on the Lord and live for Him and trust in Him, I want to do it my way. And again, all of this is building upon the idea of covenant that we've talked about over the last few weeks. To live in covenant relationship with God means that he graciously has his arms open to us, welcoming us into special relationship with him. And he's constantly, faithfully forgiving us. From our point of view then in the covenant, our job is to be faithful to him. Our job is to come to him in repentance and to live for him and to trust him and to obey him. And this is where chapter 13 reminds us that to live in covenant relationship with God, we need to have a heart after God's own heart. We need to have a heart that desires to do God's will and truly love the very word of God. But church, we need to be reminded that just because we find initial success in life, I look at the example of Saul. He had a wonderful resume. Seemed like he was doing everything right. And God was giving him great victories over his enemies. But just because we are successful 
and look like we have everything together doesn't mean we have a heart after God's own heart. And so we need to do deep, introspective um, um, work in our own lives, examining and asking God, God, what kind of heart do I have? I don't want to end up like Saul. I don't want to just go through the motions and think that I'm a good person. I want to know whether or not I have a heart after you. I want to love you and trust you and serve you. But just because we look successful doesn't mean that our heart is right before God. And importantly, just because we are confronted about sin or listen to some sermons and wise counsel doesn't mean we have a heart after God as well. Saul looked good on the inside, on the outside, and he had a prophet who called him out on his sin. Yet that did not, in and of itself, change Saul's life. What we need is a supernatural act of God to work in us and through us. We need God. We need to trust that He is the one who's going to give us the thing that we cannot accomplish on our own. So as I close this morning, church, I'm going to ask you one last question. What can we possibly do about this? God is good. God is gracious. Saul turned his back on God offered up all these excuses for why he wanted to do things his own way rather than God's ways, we learn that Saul didn't have a heart after God's own heart. And we too are like Saul, born into sin. We don't have a heart after God's own heart. What can we possibly do about this situation? Well, it's like that old hymn always said, trust and obey. There's this idea at the root of the Christian life It's this two-pronged idea, trust and obey. First of all, trust in the one true king, Jesus, because that king never failed. Saul failed, David failed, Solomon failed, all of the kings following them, they all failed. Christ never failed. Saul reminds us that we're all in this predicament. We have hearts that aren't really following after God. At least we're not born that way. What do we need to do? Trust that God sent somebody who never failed and he acted on our behalf. He didn't just die on our behalf so that we could have forgiveness of sins, but if we trust in Jesus, his life becomes our life and his righteousness becomes our righteousness, meaning trusting in the king, trusting in Jesus means I know I'm going to fail. I know my heart is going to waver from time to time. But I trust in the king who never wavered. And so when my heavenly father looks on me, he's not going to see a heart that strays to the left and the right. He's going to see the righteousness of his son, Jesus. And that's the hope that we have. That's why I say, what can we do about this? First of all, trust. Trust in the one who lived perfectly, who sacrificed his life for you perfectly, who is faithfully interceding for you perfectly. And then secondly, obey. Trust and obey. Jesus never failed us. We can trust in him. Our response to this is to live out the grace of God with love and obedience. And we can't do it on our own. We can't just will ourselves into loving God. We can't just will ourselves into trusting his word and obeying him. That's why we need both. We need to trust and we need to obey. We trust that God is going to work. We trust that he is going to give us what we need to live for him. And we depend on that, not on ourselves. But then we obey, importantly, church. We respond with a heart that will love and trust in God's word. But Saul didn't have this. And Samuel says, God is currently searching out and looking for a man after his own heart. You've read through 1 Samuel. You know the story of Saul and David. You know exactly who Samuel's talking about. The man after God's heart was going to be King David. Again, if you know anything about the life of David, you know, He was not perfect by any stretch. Having a heart after God's own heart did not necessarily mean 
They were going to live a perfect life. But it meant that they were going to faithfully trust God in all circumstances. Trust that His Word is true when the enemy's closing in. Trust in His Word even when things are going great and God's provided me with all this success that I might, I might uh, have. Trust that His Word is true when we have to change up our worship on Sunday morning. Trust that His Word is true when we feel frustrated at orders and staying at home when we don't really want to. Trust in God's Word when we do get sick. Trust in God that He's going to bring us through it. What it means to have a heart after God's own heart is not to live perfectly, although we do want to strive to obey. What it means to have a heart after God's own heart is to trust Him faithfully. Trust in His Son, the one true King, and trust that He is going to bring us through. Just as the psalmist said, be still before the Lord and wait patiently for Him. Fret not yourselves. Heavenly Father, we do pray that You would help us in this regard. We pray that You would give us peace. We pray that You would give us more faith and trust in who You are. Oh, Father, there can be so many times that we come up with excuses to do things our way. And they're all rooted in human selfishness or they're rooted in fear or ignorance of your word even. But Father, we pray that you would give us a supernatural trust in who you are and what your word says. No matter what we walk through, we would always default back to trust. Trust in you. Trust in your sovereign power. Trust in the work of your son Jesus. Trust that we are forgiven. Trust that we can be sustained in you. And trust that you have a home waiting for us, an eternal life that cannot be taken. Trust, Lord, that our faith cannot be shaken. Father, we pray that you would enhance and build us in that faith, even in the days ahead as we are uncertain what tomorrow is going to hold. We can be absolutely certain in who you are. Lord, help us not be like Saul. Help us to have a heart after your own heart. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All church family, thank you so much for being here with us this morning. I hope you were blessed through the word of God, through the music that we were able to share here together. We're going to keep doing this in the weeks ahead. So I'm hoping that the weather gets a little bit warmer because my ears are a little bit chilly right now. But you know what? For the next few Sundays, until we're under these stay-at-home orders, keep driving into church at 1030 on Sunday, and we'll have services just like this. Um, God bless, stay healthy, and we'll see you next week. Take care.